think that it's really important that people understand that there are different qualities of evidence. And the quality of evidence is incredibly important when you are one determining cause and effect, but also if you have a working hypothesis, which really the low quality evidence, for example, observational data, epidemiological data, is really to generate a, hypo a hypothesis rather than um, the opposite. So Don, maybe you can give an example of that to help people understand um, what it is that, you know, what I'm trying to get across. Yeah, the, the kinds of evidence, um, people like big population studies where there's lots of people involved and you have a, what's called a hard outcome, like a heart attack or a death or something, you know, where they're truly a measurable outcome. But it's very hard in nutrition to attribute any single lifestyle or food to that. So, you know, our best data is always what we call random controlled trials, where you set up a very clean control versus one difference, you know, where you might be comparing this person had uh, chicken protein and that person had beef protein, but everything else was exactly the same. And you'd ask, is there an outcome difference? Most of those kinds of studies are limited in how many people and how long you can run them. And that's really important. So I just want to yeah. say, uh, Dr. Lehman, and point this out to you guys is that, you know, a randomized control trials typically are a much smaller population. It takes if you've done research, which I have, and Don obviously has for many decades, you have to recruit patients. It's not an easy process. They have to all fall in a very specific um, demographic. And so these randomized controlled trials are oftentimes very small. The N is very small. It could be 15, 20. It could be less than that. So yeah. just keep that in mind. That doesn't necessarily negate the quality of the study. And Perhaps it's not quite a criticism, but it is the standard uh, in the field. And, and so when you do those kinds of random control trials, usually you're looking for a biomarker because you're not going to run it long enough for somebody to have a heart attack or, or cancer or something like that. So usually you're looking for like a change in blood lipids or a change in muscle protein synthesis or something that's measurable in a shorter period of time. For me, when I go into literature and I want to believe something, um, the first thing I look for is, uh, you know, there are, to me, there are kind of three levels. One is basic experimental nutrition, mechanistic work often done in animals. So is there a clear mechanism? Second I mean, is- people, That is, it is not easy to read. So what Dr. Yeah. Lane was talking about is, he's really talking about the basic science. And these are yeah. the- uh, notoriously published in cell, or I mean, very complex. I mean, this is how we to read. This is Not how we, this is how we discovered the leucine effect. We were working in rodents. We were doing exercise, and we were studying the mTOR, and that's how we discovered all that. You can't do that kind of research in a human. You have to start with a mechanism in an animal. So I look for mechanism studies. I look for random control trials in a human with clean biomarkers. And then I'll look at for some population type study. Does it sort of, when those three all agree, then you've got pretty strong belief that, they, that they're all correct. But for example, when you've got something like cholesterol or saturated fat, or even protein and cancer, what you've got is epidemiology that says one thing, but the random control trials and the experimental evidence in animals says the opposite. So, and so now yeah. what you've got, why would you believe the, the, the weak science of epidemiology when the other two forms disagree? That is, you guys, that is the most important thing that Don has said yet. <laughs> that, I mean, listen, arguably everything that you say is important. <laughs> but people really have to understand. People send me studies all the time and they say, well, didn't you see this study that protein causes cancer? And didn't you see this? And the truth is, you guys have to look if the study is an observational study observational study is there's no direct, there's no input, right? So it's just yeah. observing or yeah. it's following people over time. It's extremely poor data. And the, the reality is, is it's used to get an idea, a, a hypothesis. It's not used to prove anything. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak about that? Is, you know, you are a, a world-class scientist, Dr. Lehman, and 
you know, if you could just speak to the fact that what we're seeing now is a narrative of individuals and large institutions that are using epidemiological data and observational data to prove to prove information. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that is agenda driven. And, and you know, we, we talk about, you know, if you torture data long enough, it'll confess. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, if, <laughs> you know, and that's true of epidemiology. You've got these big data sets and you've got so many things going on. So you've got people who have different body weights and different exercise and different age and some eat more vegetables and some eat less and more eggs and more meats or vegetables. And you've got all these different things going on. And to conclude one thing made a difference is pretty ridiculous. And in the epidemiology world, we have what we call risk ratios. And if you look in something like smoking, where you've got a clear thing where smoking causes lung cancer. We've got great mechanism studies. We've got random control trial studies. We've got epidemiology. And the epidemiology has risk ratios or hazard ratios up around nine or 10 or 11. And all of the people who work in the field who really pay attention to it realize that if you get risk ratios below two, one, it means there's no relationship at all. If you get below two, what it means is there's a vague relationship, but we have no real knowledge of what among all the factors it is. And if you look at nutrition, almost all of the epidemiology for nutrition falls at 1.1 to 1.3, which is truly meaningless. It may be statistically significant, but it's totally physiologically meaningless. Right. And, you know, even to, to highlight something else is, is when, you know, there was that Annals of Internal Medicine study that really said that we didn't need to cut back on red meat or processed meat. And you've got some very zealot scientists saying that, see, you know, protein, I don't know why they came to this conclusion, and this was the Annals of Internal Medicine, see, protein increases your risk of stroke and heart disease by 18%. Isn't this huge? You know, and it's all BS. So when you look at um, epidemiolo epidemiological data, let me give you an example. The risk of smoking and lung cancer is anywhere, the increase is anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 percent. Right. Okay, because it's a risk ratio above two or three, or, you know, really a risk ratio of 12. You're talking about two to 3,000 percent risk increase. And it's a single, it's a single action. You know, you can identify it. You can identify how many cigarettes per day people have. You can identify all of those and get a clean relationship. I remember I did a study. I was director of research at the American Egg Board for a while. And we did a study looking at eggs and obesity and diabetes. And when you do the epidemiology, you get uh, data back that say eggs correlate with obesity and and uh, uh, diabetes. But when you then start dividing the data, what you find is from the lowest quartile to the highest quartile of egg consumption is three eggs a week to three and a half. And so that means a half an egg a week, which would be 40 calories, is the cause of obesity in the United States. I mean, it's just nonsense. But what you then find out is the people who have the most eggs per week have the highest BMI, they have the lowest exercise, they smoke the most, they drink the most, they have the least vegetables, the least fruit, and the most saturated fat. And yet we conclude that eggs caused it. I mean, it's just nonsense. Right, right. You know, and it, it's so interesting. It's, so you guys have to understand the quality of data matters. And there's a hierarchy of data. You guys can go on my Instagram and check out. I have a chart of hierarchy of data. You have randomized controlled trials at the top. And, you know, truly expert opinion, opinion is the lowest. So you guys go check that out. And by the way, if you liked this video, subscribe to the channel, like, and share it.